Licence to Kill was unlike any of the previous Bond films. Released in 1989, it was by far the most violent Bond film, and arguably still is. Timothy Dalton's second and final Bond film has gained greater recognition in recent years, having previously been criticised more often than not. Casino Royale was Daniel Craig's first Bond film, and much like Licence to Kill, redefined the mainstream expectation of a Bond film. Unlike Licence to Kill, Casino Royale was widely praised at the time of its release, back in 2006. Of these two violent and emotionally driven Bond films, which is best? Timothy Dalton's performance in Licence to Kill is simply superb. The Living Daylights wasn't exactly written with any specific actor in mind, so some aspects of that film feel like something from the Moore era. With Licence to Kill, it's a proper Dalton era entry. Dalton's views on Bond are well documented, and it seems that the producers, the writers, and the director John Glenn really took into consideration Dalton's opinions on Bond. This was true to an extent with The Living Daylights, but it's much more consistent throughout Licence to Kill. It is a raw and intense performance, and is one of the very best 007 performances. Dalton reinvented the Bond performance, how could it possibly be compared to previous versions? For the first time since Live and Let Die, David Hedison returned as Felix Leiter. His return is rather unusual, as at this point in the series, no actor had reprised his role as Felix Leiter. Why Hedison came back, I do not know. David Hedison worked well alongside Timothy Dalton, despite the obvious age gap. Unlike most Leiter Bond pairings, you do believe that these two are genuine friends. Leiter is of course very pivotal to the plot, despite being absent for most of the runtime. Pam Bouvier is a pretty good Bond girl, and very much aids Bond's vendor. Debtor. I don't really buy the romance that much, and it seems more like a requirement. I do think that the romantic angle certainly works better than with the other Bond girl of License to Kill. Of the 80s Bond girls, Pam Bouvier is amongst the very best. Lupe certainly serves a purpose in the plot, and has a close connection to Sanchez. However, I think this rivalry of sorts with Pam Bouvier doesn't really work, and does drag the more interesting revenge plot down somewhat. I think Pam Bouvier was a great Bond girl, and while Lupe could have been removed from the story, due to her connection to Sanchez, her involvement is actually essential. Basically, the two characters work fairly well in the story, but there are some issues that persist. The adversaries of License to Kill are amongst the absolute highlights of the film, without question. Milson Crest was one of the henchmen in License to Kill, and while he isn't in it all that much, his presence is fantastic. I like how Crest meets his end, too. How Bond is very much responsible for framing him. The morality is very murky in this particular Bond film, and this is apparent throughout, least of all with the villains. Ed Killer first starts out as a regular DEA officer before he betrays Bond and Felix, and is instrumental in the release of Sanchez. Killifer also meets a great end, the first adversary to die in Bond's revenge mission. Killifer always seemed like a bit of a coward, so the way he goes out is all the more fitting. Benicio del Toro appears as one of his earliest film appearances as Dario. There is something rather unsettling about Dario right from his first scenes. He is the one who rumbles Bond's cover much later in the film. His absence during most of Bond's vendetta is the reason why Bond doesn't get rumbled sooner. Dario is excellent. He has few lines, but really does make an impact. Robert Darvius from Franz Sanchez is easily one of the best villains in the entire series. Sanchez, despite committing all sorts of terrible acts, has an air of respectability about him, perhaps because of his fixation on loyalty. Sanchez is a perfect adversary for Dalton's Bond, and their scenes together were amongst the highlights of the film. The story for License to Kill is excellent. There are a few flaws, but ultimately it still stands as a very good Bond film. There is some dodgy back projection for some reason. This film looks cheaper than The Living Daylights. This does affect the film somewhat, but if you can let some dated visuals slide, you're in for a great couple of hours. It's perhaps a shame that people weren't quite ready for this type of bomb film in 1989, but its recent resurgence in popularity can be at least partially attributed to the next film I will be discussing. Casino Royale can be at least partially praised for this resurgence in popularity for the Dalton duology. It certainly exposed the mainstream audience to a darker, grittier Bond film. This time, the mainstream audience were rather enthusiastic. I've already discussed Casino Royale fairly recently, so if you want some more of my thoughts on that, I suggest you check out my Daniel Craig era retrospective. Daniel Craig's debut performance is utterly captivating. It is similar to what Dalton did, but in hindsight, now that Craig's era is over, it is actually something rather unique. Craig received a great deal of backlash due to his casting, but the this film very much proved the doubters wrong. Craig's debut is practically perfect. While License to Kill had a few issues with the Bond girls, Casino Royale has no such issue with its one Bond girl. Yes, there is Solange Dimitrios, but there is basically one Bond girl, let's be honest. Eva Green as Vesper Lind is easily one of the best Bond girls in the entire series. It's refreshing, as many Bond girls beforehand made little impact. Here, much of Bond's motivation later in the film is due to his relationship with Vesper. Even as Vesper dies, her presence is felt in the subsequent Craig films, perhaps a little too much. But Eva Green's 
performance is faultless. Eva Green and Daniel Craig had excellent chemistry, and this is especially obvious during the scene on the train where their characters first meet. Alex Dimitrios is a rather important character during the first act, and is essentially Bond's main adversary before Le Chiffre becomes more prominent later on. Le Chiffre had been introduced, but Bond had yet to meet him. Dimitrios is a cracking part of the character lineup, and not one character in this film is wasted. Le Chiffre, as played by Mads Mikkelsen, is perfect this film. His scenes with Bond are excellent, and a far cry from the more outlandish villains of yesteryear. He is a totally different villain from Fran Sanchez, but both are equally superb. It's very close for me, though mainstream opinion would likely differ. Jeffrey Wright's appearance as Felix Leiter may be limited, but every scene counts. Leiter was very much in the original novel, so it made sense to include Leiter in this adaptation. As I've said, every character counts, and Felix Leiter is no exception. Across his three films as Leiter, Jeffrey Wright is on par with David Hedison as the very best actor to play Felix Leiter on screen. It's worth pointing out just how well written Casino Rao is. The script is truly excellent. The dialogue is really engaging. It's a testament to the writers that some of the most engaging scenes are dialogue centred. Bond in particular is a very well written character and very much embodies the more Fleming-esque elements. Craig's interpretation of the character is excellently realised. Casino Rao is a very confidently put together film, not just in terms of the script. So which is best? License to Kill is really great. Bond's journey is really compelling and engaging. It's unlike anything we've seen Bond go for at this point, and Dalton is perfect in what ends up being his final Bond film, but what a great finale. The script may not be as polished as Casino Rails, but it very much made the intended impact. Fran Sanders is an intimidating villain who is a genuine physical threat to Bond, as seen in their final confrontation. I will never tire of defending this great film. It has flaws such as the production values, but John Glenn's final Bond film as director proved to be utterly fantastic. Casino Rail blew people so Socks off back in 2006, the vast majority had forgotten about License to Kill, or weren't old enough to have seen it in 1989. Casino Rail doesn't get anything wrong. The characters are all fantastic and all serve their purposes in the story. Craig's debut performance is simply the best Bond debut ever. Just as a film, ignoring all the Bond connections for a moment, Casino Rail is seriously well made. It is respect for the original novel, but adds tons of new facets to the film series. Casino Rail is an absolute triumph. Both of these violent gritty Bond films aren't violent and gritty just for the sake of it. They both have really great stories where a great deal of thought went into the structure of the stories and how everything would connect. License to Kill may feel a bit like Bond meets Miami Vice on the surface, but it's far more than just that. Likewise, Casino Royale may feel like Jason Bourne meets Bond, but it too is far more than just that. Bond films always reflect the times in which they are made. Both License to Kill and Casino Royale are excellent, impactful Bond films, but for this showdown, there can only be one winner. Of these two films, Casino Royale is the the best. Check out my recent Daniel Craig retrospective for more. Thanks for watching.